guys, I'm here at the Concourse of Elegance at Hampton Court 2021. And what's the first car I see when I come in here? But only the Aston Martin Bulldog from 1979, the one of one concept car. My God, I had a picture of this on the wall. I love my wedge shaped cars. This has been reborn. I've got with me Richard Gauntlet. Tell me a little bit about what happened to this car in 1979 after I put a picture of it on the wall. Exactly. Well, so in 1979, it was finished by Aston. It was launched to the press in April 1980. Um, it then went off and did various high-speed runs, um, culminating in a run at Myra of over 191 verified. And you've got to bear in mind that Ferrari and Jag uh, sorry, Ferrari and Lamborghini at that time were making a lot of claims about their top speed, but there was no there was no verification. So Aston went out and did it with very little money. It did 191 miles an hour, which put it in the Guinness Book of Records for the world's fastest road car in 1980. So before we get into that, what actually was that? Because this was a concept car, but it was a working concept car. So what what did it have? What what did what did, what was it running? So it was running. Uh, it's a bespoke chassis, all done for this car. At the heart of it is the is the very standard 5.3 Aston V8, but with two extremely large gauge Garrett Air Research turbochargers. Um, so it's a very tractable car. You know, you can actually drive it, but the rest of the car is completely bespoke. <laughs> And it has gullwing doors. This is absolutely amazing. Doors. Do you want me to show you the doors? Yeah, let's have a look. The, the, the gullwing doors are actually hydroelectric. Um, you'll hear the noise. Well, there's actually a bank of buttons on the side of the car. There's a little compartment. And in this is so very 70s. It's brilliant. This is absolutely <laughs> awesome. Check this out. Oh, my goodness. The, the, hydro doors, <laughs> the doors are hugely heavy, so they do need to be. There was no way in hell that any of us would be able to open the doors from inside. But Aston was very pragmatic. They even, um, you know, they were really thinking about stuff. They even built in a quick release system. Should you have a problem with the car, yeah. you can release the bolts and push the doors off. Yeah. So, so like all were, Gullwing cars, when they, if they flip, if there's a risk of them flipping over, you have that bl explosive yeah, bolt. And, right? and, you know, and this was small company, Aston Martin, but great, great engineers and very, at the end of the day, very very pragmatic yeah. it even has a spare wheel and this is a concept car this is a concept car exactly but they wanted to show what, what they like were before capable. you close it what I like is how this chassis has been designed because normally where you would have a sill here exactly. there's literally nothing and that is the reason when Aston Martin set out what they said is they said and they're often quoted as the fact that they said we want to build the world's ultimate supercar but what people forget to quote is later they said through the eyes of an Aston Martin owner and they thought that an Aston Martin owner would never go and buy a Countach because of the getting over the sill. So the car was designed so it's easy to get in and out of. Yeah. You still have your myriad of dead cows inside <laughs> to keep you to keep your Aston owner happy. Brown cow, brown car. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, and, and so it was all done around the what does an Aston Martin want from uh, owner want from a supercar? And the, the answer was the Countach and things like that were not it. So they had to think from scratch about their owners, who they were, you know, who they were hugely reliant on their loyalty. And who designed the car? The car was designed by William Towns, who also designed the DBS, the original, which then became the V8. And also it uh, became, um, he also designed the 1976, the wedge-shaped Lagonda, which was a car that in many ways saved Aston Martin. That's another one of my favourites. Popularity in the Middle East especially. Uh, uh, you know, I used to live out in the Middle East, and I used to see them a lot in Saudi Arabia. They were very, very popular. Well, the, the Lagonda is one of those cars that all I can say is, you can go and spend as much as you like on your new Phantom, but if you roll up outside the Savoy and the guy behind you rolls up in a 1970s Lagonda, your entourage is looking the wrong way. <laughs> and the thing about the Lagonda is that it's now, today, cooler than it ever was, right? Yeah. Well, I slightly disagree with that because I've always thought it was cool. I think social media and all the rest of it, people, have, people are looking harder at things like this. And in the same way that this deserves its place in the spotlight, sometimes you have to show them before they go, Oh shit, you know, <laughs> that is really cool, yeah, you know, yeah. and that's so, what we're doing. So this is now, this. so most supercars, they appear on the stage, they may do a one-off uh, stunt or whatever, and then they just disappear into the annals of automotive history. But this is live, it's here, it's in front of me, and it looks fantastic. Live, What's the story? Here, and within, so it's live, it is here. Um, we have, you know, it's all running. It now will begin its phase of testing. Um, and then we are actually, the Royal Navy have very kindly allowed us to use the Yeovilton Air Base to do some high-speed testing on the runways. And then it is 40 years since it was supposed to go to the Wolfsburg plant. 
to do its high, highest speed test to reach 200. They never had the, the chance to do that because my father took over Aston in early 81, decided it wasn't a good use of funds and they needed money. So he sold the car to a Saudi prince. Um, so it never so went this, to do... So, hold, hold on, hold oh, yes, on right yes, there, yes, hold yes, on right yes. there. So the, so the original concept car was sold to a Saudi prince. Did it, was, it go to Saudi Arabia? It was sold to a Saudi prince. No, it went to, uh, we believe, the, the actual purchaser's son who was studying in Seattle um, and then it did various high-speed tests on a disused um, a disused highway in Arizona and by the time he'd done that a few times he twisted enough major engine components to mean that it wasn't going to run again for a very long time um, and then the car reappeared in other collections but no one ever set about actually trying to make it work properly and that's why we went and got the original team behind it as well as CMC so that together we knew everything about why things were done the way they were done originally and how to how to incorporate some modern technology to make sure that the thing can't chew itself to pieces again. And so before the end of this calendar year, we will go and do 200 miles an hour in it. So it will fulfill its destiny, which was to do 200 miles an hour. It was, it was, it was meant to do 200. It did 191 at Myra. It was still accelerating, but there wasn't enough space. And so we're going to finish it, finish and close the book. And I think deservedly so. That's an amazing, it would, it would be a great way to complete the story, but maybe the story won't end there. I mean, a Saudi prince bought this back in the day. What if another Saudi prince wants to buy it today or one like I it? Think, I think he would have to pry it out of the hands of Philip Sarafim because Philip has done this two years and he's a great, he's a great custodian. Of Philip this. is the owner of the car. Philip is the owner of the car. He also owns Lancia Stratos Zero and, and he's well known for using that on the road. It's, it was designed to do a function, it performed that function, so he's bloody going to use it for that function. Is there any likelihood of a continuation series? We've seen that before from Aston Martin, or a, a, maybe a one-off, or maybe a limited edition or anything like that? You'd have to ask someone from Aston Martin. Richard, thank you so much, A, for talking me through this car, but B, for just being involved in the team that's brought this amazing thing back to life. Pleasure. It's been, it's been a long time coming and it's been a great privilege and uh, I'm looking forward to leading driving it, you know. <laughs> awesome. Shut your doors. <laughs> Let's see the doors closing. That's awesome. So, you want something sleek and glamorous? And then check out the Jaguar E-Type featured in our launch issue, alongside many other features such as... Buying guides, owner's tips, and even how to buy your own first classic car. Go Classics is about the cars that you relate to, the cars that you've dreamed of, and the cars that you can own, run, and enjoy. At Go Classics, we'll tell you how. Go Classics is the most exciting car magazine on the shelves today. And it's out now. And you can get one by heading over to goclassics.co.uk where you can find some of our fantastic limited time subscription offers. Forget about the boring, the pompous, the self-important. If you want something new, Go, go Classics! classics.